couple of months ago, I bought this Mac Plus. Uh, I got it from a place in Minneapolis called Free Geek, which is a place where you can bring your old electronics for recycling or they can refurbish it and resell it or whatever. As a way to raise money, Free Geek also sells vintage equipment, which they refurbish. Uh, I happened to look at their website and saw this on it. And this is a uh, Macintosh Plus from 1986, although this one was actually made a little bit later uh, in about 1988 or 89. They, were, they continued to be sold until about 1990 or so. It was the first Mac to have a SCSI port. It was the first model to have one megabyte of RAM compared to 128K or 512K in the earlier models. Although it did use the same 8 megahertz processor that came with the original Mac in 1984. And it had this larger um, keyboard with a numeric keypad and arrow keys. And it also had a 800K floppy disk drive, which was new. Um, so this is basically like the original 128K Mac and the 512K Mac that followed it, but a bit more capable. This is also not the original color. This is the later platinum color, like the Macintosh 2 and the SE. So this has been fully refurbished. They, I assume they replaced all the capacitors and other stuff that tends to fail on these models. Clean the, clean the floppy drive so it works great and basically got it in good shape. Uh, when I first booted it up, it, it worked, and the only thing I needed to fix was the uh, video, which was a little bit squashed vertically, but that was easy enough to fix. But there's some um, video adjustments inside the computer that can, where you can adjust that. It also only came with one megabyte of RAM, so I managed to get four megabytes uh, from eBay for 25 bucks. It was also missing the perimeter RAM battery, which is a little battery that you stick in the back of the computer that saves things like the date and time and the mouse settings. I sort of like to have those things in there um, because it, you don't, it means you don't have to fix the mouse settings every time you start it up. And it also remembers what time it is if you're working with files and things like that. The problem with the batteries is that after a while they start to leak and this can cause a lot of damage inside the computer. I also got um, this little, um, what they call a programmer switch, which fits into the side of the computer and gives you a, a reset and interrupt button so you don't have to turn the computer off if it hangs or crashes or something like that. You don't have to turn it off and on to reboot it. Um, so this does have a SCSI port, but I don't really have any SCSI uh, hard drives anymore. Um, I haven't had any for years. Um, but I do have um, something called a blue SCSI. This is one that I happen to have laying around. Um, unfortunately, it has this larger 50-pin Syntronics connector on it, uh, which does not match the connector on the back of the Mac Plus, which is a 25-pin connector. Um, I got around this at first by daisy-chaining it with an Apple CD drive that I happen to have and a, a big, big, heavy SCSI cable. The SCSI cables back then were ridiculous. I mean, they were, they were like half-inch thick and full of wires, and uh, SCSI was kind of a pain to deal with compared to things like USB or Thunderbolt or even FireWire, you know, 20 years ago. So I sent for an adapter, and that, that worked okay, but it looked kind of ridiculous. And so I finally just sent for a uh, smaller Blue SCSI device, uh, which had a 25-pin connector, and that works a lot better. What the Blue SCSI is, is um, it's a... Uh, device that has, um, it's basically kind of a, I'm not sure exactly what 
the circuitry in it is sort of like a Raspberry Pi type of thing. I'm not sure if that's actually what it is. Um, but it lets you use an SD card, a little tiny, um, you know, thing about the size of your fingernail. And on this, on this SD card, you can place up to seven hard drive images. So these are basically files that when you connect it up to the, to an old Mac and it boots up, it thinks that these things are actual spinning hard drives, which are not, they're just little files on a, on a tiny little memory card. So these things work great. Um, they're much faster than a real hard drive and uh, much more convenient because you can mount them on your modern computer and get files in and out of the hard drive images uh, very easily with something like um, Mini VMAC or Sheep Shaver or um, Basilisk 2, which are all emulators that emulate old Mac computers um, from different eras. So then the question was, um, what was I going to use this for? And then I remembered um, I belong to a group called Type Tuesday um, that meets in Minneapolis periodically to talk about type design and fonts and things like that. And um, I told them I got this Mac Plus and that it would be perfect for doing a demo of what it was like to make fonts on a Macintosh back in the late 80s. Uh, when we announced it at the May meeting, uh, everyone was excited about it. And in fact, it sounded like a lot of people were going to be showing up. So I wanted to figure out a way to, I mean, everybody standing around this little tiny computer wasn't really going to work. So I wanted a way to um, show the image on the Mac Plus here on up on the projector that they had in the room where, where we uh, do our events at the Minneapolis Central Library. So my first idea was to simply point a video camera at the Mac Plus screen and feed that into the video projector in the room. But that seemed like it was going to be kind of awkward having this camera sitting right next to me, um, like kind of in the way I might bump it while I'm moving the mouse or whatever. So just by chance, I happened to see a video on YouTube on a channel called One Bit Fever Dream where he showed how he used a device called an RGB to HDMI um, to connect a Macintosh SE30, I think, to, a, to HDMI so he could stream games and stuff like that. And he also said that this works with older Macs like the Mac Plus. Um, and I thought, wow, this, is, this would be perfect. So that way I could just connect the Mac here to my uh, MacBook Pro laptop and then stream that to the video projector in the, in the meeting room. This also meant I would be able to record the screen on my laptop at the same time I was giving the talk and streaming to the projector. So I'd have a recording of the entire talk that I could upload to YouTube later on. This was something the Type Tuesday people asked about since uh, maybe some people might not be able to attend and would want to see the talk later. It was still about a month or so before my demo was going to happen and I wasn't sure if it would arrive in time but I did eventually get one uh, from a place in Texas I guess called uh, Texelect. It's basically this little Raspberry Pi card with um, I guess it's a daughter card attached to it that has um, sort of a VGA style output on it or input and a HDMI output and then you uh, can hook it up to USB to get power. It has some buttons on it for showing an on-screen menu for doing settings and things like that. So I sent for it and it arrived a few days before I was supposed to give the talk so that would give me enough time to uh, get it hooked up. I, I also sent for a couple of other things because I needed a cable to get it from inside the Mac and connected to this sort of VGA style connector. 
Uh, so I sent for some uh, what they call DuPont cables, which are used by electronic hobbyists, and also a, um, a DB9 connector that didn't need any soldering. Um, and so I've got this coming out of the uh, Kensington lock hole in the Mac Plus, and it's connected inside directly to the big connector that connects the analog to the logic board where the video signals from the logic board go to the screen. More or less like uh, doing a phone tap. Um, just stick some of these leads into there and they make a connection. They, I, you can sort of hijack the video from the Mac Plus um, to, so that you, it can be connected to this uh, little board. So I got it all hooked up. I seem to be getting a picture. I basically hooked it up to my MacBook Pro running QuickTime Player in the, um, you just set it to record a movie and select the video source, which in this case was USB video. Oh, I also had a uh, capture card that I used to get from HDMI into my MacBook Pro. People use these things for streaming video games and stuff like that, so I figured it would work for this too, and it did. Uh, except at first I wasn't getting a very stable image. It was, it was just kind of screwed up. I tried all of the different settings that I found online um, that were related to getting the RGB to HDMI to work with a Mac Plus or a, an old classic Mac. None of the settings seemed to work and I kind of made matters worse by trying to install a firmware update to the latest firmware which I found on GitHub to the SD card on the or RGB to HDMI board. That seemed to just make it even less stable. And then I realized that I'd made a mistake when it, before I put the um, firmware on it, I just did a simple erase in, on my MacBook Pro of the SD card. And I guess you need to do a low level erase on these things for the firmware to work properly. Once I did that, um, everything worked beautifully. Uh, in fact, even I was even able to just select a um, preset for the Mac Plus from the menu and boom, it just all worked perfectly. And here you see the RGB to HDMI device in action. The Mac Plus is booting on the left. Uh, it's capturing the video coming out of the Mac Plus and feeding it into the capture card that's plugged into my MacBook Pro on the right. And you can see it perfectly mirrors the uh, video from the Mac Plus. And I wasn't content to uh, just bring this bare board to the meeting, so I made this Lego case uh, to put it in, as you do. So once I had all that done, it was just a matter of getting all the software and font documents onto the, onto the blue SCSI for, for the demo, so I could boot from that where I, you know, demoed um, Fontographer and Fantastic and a bunch of other old, old software. The talk went great and you can see it on my channel here. There is one remaining upgrade I'd like to do to this. Um, currently, in order to connect the Blue SCSI, I have to supply power to it via USB. So I've got this long cable going to a um, little iPhone-style power block and on other, other Macs, you don't need to do that because they have what they call termination power on the SCSI port. This first uh, Mac that had SCSI didn't have that enabled, um, so it doesn't supply any power to the SCSI port. Fortunately, there is a really simple fix. Um, if you're handy with a soldering iron, you can add just a little tiny diode. There's a spot on the logic board that's left open and if you um, solder that in there, it will supply power to the SCSI port and I can just plug in the blue SCSI with, with no external power supply. Uh, but I haven't done that yet. I do plan to do more videos with this Mac Plus, uh, basically demoing or showing how early Mac font software worked and uh, uh, maybe some things like Illustrator and you know, other early apps, maybe HyperCard, I don't know. The first few years that I used a Mac, I had 
machines like this. Eventually I added a large monitor to my Mac Plus and other upgrades and eventually I moved to a Macintosh 2 and, and so on, kind of rele relegating the Mac Plus to uh, uh, the side. At one point I had sort of a accelerator card running in it which made it much less reliable uh, so I ended up putting this big sort of hat on it that um, had a fan in it that would draw heat out because these, uh, these old compact Macs didn't have fans. On one hand, I love that they didn't have a fan because I don't like fan noise. But on the other hand, it sort of limited how much you could st stuff into these things before it would start to overheat. But the reason I want to do this is because I haven't really seen any demos of like early Mac font software on YouTube or anywhere. There's a few videos covering early font editors on Adam Twardock's channel on, um, on Vimeo, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. But nothing about the really early Mac font software. Um, I've already done one on Apple's font editor 2.0, which you may have seen, but I also plan to do one specifically about early Fontographer and Font Studio. Um, and maybe some other things. Now, why does anybody care about this stuff? It's all obsolete now, right? I think it's important to show how this stuff worked, just because this is where an entire industry got its start. And it, I think it's important and interesting to see where it all began. So until next time.